there's some similarities there. And then the last piece that I'm going to talk about a little bit is security. Uh, security is actually really important because specifically in the IoT space, it is extremely hard to do. Okay, and, it, and with IoT devices, the concern of security and privacy and, and who can access certain devices kind of goes through the roof as opposed to any other computer systems that we've had sort of to this point. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the pieces that Google has put into the Brillo architecture, both at the platform level as well as within the services, that help to make that easier on those who want to build products on it. So that you sort of get security for free, you get security by default, without having to, to stay up at night and whether or not, or determine whether or not you've come up with some sort of door lock that just about anybody can get into, allowing others to break into people's homes. Okay. So those are kinds of the, the three things that we're going to talk about here today. Okay, so I mentioned that Brillo is based on Android. So how many of you have seen a stack like this before, the diagram like this? Okay. So this is a typical diagram of what the Android software stack looks like. Right. You've got some hardware specific pieces there at the bottom, things like the bootloader and the kernel. Uh, Android has some middleware pieces there that are really more specific to the Android platform, things like the hardware extraction layer, which if you've never heard of that before, is sort of like Android's device drivers. This is what manufacturers provide as part of an Android device to make your camera work, your sensors work, that kind of thing. Uh, so they have these device drivers in the layer, a uh, series of native services, uh, as well as the application runtime. So this is, as Chet mentioned in the last session, this would be your Dolby for your art. This is the runtime that the applications that developers are writing in Java execute inside. Okay. And then inside of Android, we have the framework layer on top of that, which is all those Java frameworks that developers are actually touching. Right? These are your activities, your services, all the managers you talk to. Um, all that stuff is built into that layer, and then a few core applications on top of that. So this stack is essentially what a device would look like, an Android device, if you got it just straight out of the box, right? This is the Android open source project on a Nexus device with no additional user applications or anything else installed. There are still some core applications built into the platform for basic functionality, messaging, phone, browser, all that stuff is in the open source project as well and would find its way onto a device. So I mentioned that Brillo is Android based. So what would the Brillo stack look like compared to this? Brillo stack looks something like that. Basically all of that Java stuff is gone. There's no runtime, there's no framework, and all those core applications that run on top of that stuff has been removed from the system. Okay? This makes it extremely lean but it also means that all of those familiar SDKs that application developers might be used to don't exist. Okay? And we'll talk about how you would develop applications for a system like this a little bit later on. And similarly, in that sort of native services layer, there are some things that are still around, but there are others that were removed. You know, there's a fair amount of native services that only existed to support those job frameworks. And so once we remove those, uh, there's no need for any of that stuff to, to hang on. Now, interestingly enough, when you cut out all that stuff from Android, it turns out there's a couple holes to fill, okay? even just in the system itself. And so, while you may or this was interesting to me, and so it might be interesting to you, that you have probably heard in the press or whatever that Brillo is Android-based, but it turns out that Android is not the only platform that has code in Brillo. There are several of these layers where they've actually pulled in code from Chrome OS. And they did that for the purpose of filling in those holes. Okay? So if you actually look at the software stack and you pull down the code for, uh, for the real operating system, you'll see a number of packages that actually came from the Chrome OS side, most of them living in the services layer to fill in some of those holes left by taking out the Java framework. So there are some connectivity services and other things that applications can use that they actually pulled in from Chrome OS team because they are written in native code and can live without the Java runtime. Okay? So there's a lot of that going on in there, as well as the entire bootloader architecture is pretty much taken from Chrome OS. And we'll talk about some of the reasons and benefits of them choosing that a little bit later on as well. Okay. 
So that's sort of the high level difference between what makes Android Android and what makes Brillo Android like. Okay. So what about these core services that they've added into the platform that are specific to Brillo? Does anybody recognize what that logo is? Can anybody tell me what that is? We. 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 Right. So the big one, the one that you probably all heard about that makes Brillo uh, unique, I guess you will, in terms of a, an operating system choice, is its integration with Google's other IoT offering, which is the Weave protocol. Okay. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about what Weave is and what it brings to the table, <coughs> in case you're not too terribly familiar with it. So we'll start there. So Weave is a device-to-device a -device communications protocol. Okay? It's not specific to Brillo. It's intended to be implemented across a wide range of IoT and embedded devices. But Brillo has it built in by default. So if you choose Brillo, you're sort of getting Weave for free. Okay? But let's talk a little bit about what it really is. So the, the Weave architecture provides three primary things to developers of products. Uh, that we have a set of mobile SDKs that allow iOS and Android and even on the web devices to interact with these embedded devices that are being enabled. They provide device libraries to embed into those devices and for example Brillo devices would be one of those choices but there are others. And they provide a layer of cloud services that allow users from their mobile device or from the web to interact with these remote devices, whether it's locally device to device or whether it's remotely using the cloud. And the APIs and the libraries abstract all of this away so that it happens automatically and securely. Okay? So as I mentioned, we have the cloud APIs and the local APIs available so that users from their mobile devices or from the devices in their home can interact with whatever this embedded thing is, whether it's a temperature sensor, or light bulbs, or whatever it is embedded with this functionality. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about those device libraries. I mentioned that Brillo has Weave enabled by default, but Weave really does live as a separate thing. And it's a library that can be included in any embedded device, providing it has the appropriate support. So Weave comes in two flavors. The first is LibWeave which is what we would find on anything that's an MMU-enabled device. Does anybody know what I mean when I say that? Does that term make sense? Okay. So an MMU-enabled device is really any processor or system on a chip that is capable of running a higher-level operating system like Linux. Okay. If, if the hardware can support that, it has an MMU, which is a memory management unit. And this would include devices running Brillo. So Brillo has LibWeave integrated in automatically. But any other embedded Linux system that you may have already built for an IoT device could include LibWeave in there as a package as well. Uh, and you could Weave enable that device potentially without using Brillo if, if you wanted to go ahead and do that. So they, they definitely want this to live on its own. But those types of devices are not what are essentially, in terms of numbers, going to dominate the IoT market. Right? A lot of the Internet of Things devices or connected devices that will be in the home are going to be much smaller, much simpler devices. You don't need to have a full Linux stack running on them. Right? Your light bulb is not going to be running Brillo. It's probably going to have a very simple microcontroller in it or something like that just to interact with the state it needs to control. So they've also provided an implementation called LibMicroWeave, which is intended for microcontroller level devices. So lower level ARM Cortex processors, things like that. So these are systems that you would have more direct access to the hardware, and you can integrate this library into those devices to get them Weave enabled as well. Okay? So they want this to cross really the entire scheme. This isn't just something that's built into Brillo. Now, both of these things are also available and developed in the open. So you know, even today, even if you don't have an invite into the official program, you can go look at the code for Weave, for both LibWeave and LibMicroWeave at weave.googlesource.com. Now, a lot of these packages or repositories that are in this project are mirrored in the Brillo project. And so that's how they get it sort of pulled in automatically on that side. But this is where the actual development is being done. Now, I will say that if you're interested in this, LibWeave is much more mature than MicroWeave. MicroWeave is still something that's kind of being baked a little bit, and it's very heavily in active development. So it kind of works, but they're still kind of moving forward on that. LibWeave is a little bit more mature. 
Okay. So what does Weave actually give you as a developer of an embedded product? Right? So there, there's two primary flows that I kind of want to walk you through. The first one is more of a device level flow. Weave provides to you the ability to get uh, your users online with your device quickly. Okay? So you think of the typical flow if someone were to buy a connected device off the shelf today. Right? They would have to go take the device out of the box, turn it on or whatever, find the instruction manual, figure out where to download the app or otherwise connect to this thing on their Wi-Fi network, uh, and do all of this provisioning and setup using the instruction manual of the device. And then that may or may not involve an, a mobile application in one form or another. It's a bit of a disconnected process, and it, it involves a lot of manual discovery on the user's part. One of the things that we've attempts to solve is to provide a discovery and provisioning flow built into the device that works automatically with people's mobile devices. Right? So whether you're on an Android device or an iOS device, if you have the appropriate software to provision Weave devices, then this flow becomes very automatic. You can discover the devices, set them up on the appropriate local network, and that flow ends with downloading whatever companion application you might want to provide them to interact with your device. Instead of it having to start with that process and having that application have to have all that logic inside. You don't have to write your mobile app with a bunch of code to actually get the thing online. We've handled all that for you and you can just write your mobile app to do the interesting stuff at the end. Okay? So all that's built into the Weave protocol, the device libraries, and the client CDs. Mm -hmm. Similarly, once the device is online, Weave provides this sort of command state architecture that allows you to interact with these devices. So from your mobile device or any device that has a client SDK on it, you can view the state of the connected devices. You can send commands to these devices to change that state. And then the device libraries on those local devices will, can, are set up to receive those commands, modify their internal local state, and track all that for you. Okay? The, all you really have to define when you're building a Weave-enabled device is the schema of what this device's state should represent. What are the things that it exposes as state? So like for a light switch, it might be on and off. For a light bulb, it might be on and off. It's a brightness value. There are a number of predefined schemas for common devices, but this is extensible. You can define whatever this is, and you just publish that, and that effectively defines what the commands are and what the state is that that device uh, can can manage. So inside of that, the device can then manage its local state. But even more than that, Weave ensures that that device's state is synchronized and propagated to all other connected devices simultaneously. So the, the, this concept exists in Weave where devices can subscribe to one another. So for instance, I'll go back to that light example. My light bulb might be subscribed to my light switch. And when I, as a user, send the command to turn on my light switch, we will automatically propagate that state to the subscribed devices saying the switch is turned on so that the light can react to that for me. Okay, all that thing of updating, maintaining, and synchronizing state across all those connected devices is done automatically in me. Okay? All right. So that's a very quick overview of what Weave brings to the table. I could spend a whole other hour talking about Weave in detail, because uh, it's, it's a pretty big thing. But that's sort of the, the first primary service that Brillo is giving you for free if you choose to use Brillo as a software stack in whatever device you're building. Okay? But there are a few other things that they brought to the table as well. The first is integrated metrics and crash reporting services. As I mentioned before, we have components from different places. Metrics and crash reporting are services that came from Chrome OS. So if you've seen this behavior in Chrome OS before, it's a safe code. But this is simply giving you as a product developer the ability to get data back from the devices you're shipping out into the field. How many active devices do you have? What versions of your software are they running? What weave commands are users actually sending? Right? I could use this analytics to say, you know, all the light bulbs we have out in the field, people are turning them on and off a lot, but nobody seems to be finding the dimmer setting. You know, maybe it's something wrong with our app, or maybe people just don't care about that feature. So you can get those types of analytics back in an, an integrated console that is part of just a traditional Google developer console if you've used any of those in the past. Same thing with crash reports. If you have a bunch of devices who have a service that's crashing repeatedly, you can see that information 
you can prioritize those and you can fix them. Okay? So it's bringing some of these flows that as mobile application developers we're used to working with to IoT or embedded devices. Something that we've drastically needed and many of us have written ourselves. Okay. The other big one is over the air updates. Along with I sort of mentioned that security is one of the most important, one of the hardest things to do right in IoT. Updates goes along with that as well. One of the hardest things to do is deploy you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of devices and then try to ship a patch in your software to all of those devices. And one, actually have it shipped there, actually have the user apply it, and all of these things. So the OTA update functionality aims to simplify that, right? So because all these devices are connected in this particular case using Weave, uh, they provide through the developer console the ability for you to create a new image for your devices, upload that image to the Google Developer Console, and then have that automatically be disseminated across your connected devices. Okay? So Brillo has built into it services to automatically on some schedule check for new updates, pull those updates down to the device, and install them automatically. Mm -hmm. And one of the really neat features about this, and again, this actually comes from the Chrome OS side, not the Android side, is the, the way that these download, these updates are applied, is they do so in such a way that they're done entirely in the background without interrupting the device's functionality. Okay? Those of you who have Android devices or Android developers, think of the process that happens when you get an over-the-air update for your phone. Right? The, the update can download automatically, but at some point you have to say, okay, yes, I'd like to apply that. And that means that your phone has to reboot into recovery mode and spend the next 10 to 15 to 20 whatever minutes applying, installing that update while it's in recovery mode and you can't actually use the device. And then at some point you can reboot it back into active mode and it might still have to do some more updating or something along those lines. Okay? Brillo aims to fix this using Chrome OS's bootloader structure. So Chrome OS actually has two parallel portions of the system running at all times. Okay? Well, they're not actually running, but uh, Chrome OS has what they call the AV partition scheme, where every, every part of the file system that is required to run your device actually has two copies, the A copy and the B copy. And at any one time, you're running from one, and the other one is available to apply an update. So the way this typically works with the OTA updates is, uh, let's say for example, I'm running on the A partitions of my device. When an over-the-air update comes in, the Brillo services will automatically download and apply that update in the B partition while I'm still running. So this all happens in the background, the user doesn't have to know if function of the device isn't interrupted or anything like that. Once that update is ready to be run, while well, the installation and everything has been patched and applied, at that point, all you have to do is reboot the device. When you reboot the device, it just starts running from the other set of partitions instead of the original. And so the, the downtime of that device is minimized all the way down to simply the time it takes to reboot the device. And then it's up to you as a product developer to determine what is the best way to facilitate that. Do you want to do it automatically in the middle of the night? Do you want to alert the user through your mobile app that the update has already been downloaded, they just have to reboot to apply it? That choice is up to you. But the portion of actually getting it onto the device and installing it with almost no downtime is completely automatic because of the services provided by Chrome. That's a big deal if you've ever had to do this yourself in an embedded world. Okay. So then we'll talk a little bit about security. So on the security side of things, uh, primarily from bringing in what's already on the Android and the Chrome OS side, Google has tried to create a system that is secure in layers and has all the security that uh, is provided by all the Google services we know and love already into this market. Okay. So we have, uh, from, from the Brillo side of things, all of the secure process isolation and sandboxing that application developers are used to when working with Android, all of that still applies on the Brillo side. So because Brillo is based on Android, all of the SE Linux policies and everything that has been used for you know, the number of Android versions past to ensure that processes are properly isolated and one process can't take down the entire system and all that stuff, it's all the same. Okay, so they brought that over wholesale. In addition, 
the functionality along the verified boot path, which is also available in uh, Android from Lollipop Plus, essentially, um, ensures that when images are downloaded and installed on this device, that they are signed appropriately, so we know who they came from, and that those images have not been tampered with, so we know they can be trusted. Both of those things are implemented in the verified boot structure from the bootloader all the way up. So if for some reason an image or an update or some change is made to that device that val invalidates those hashes or those signatures, the device simply won't boot. So it ensures that when that device boots, it's always into a known state with a good image. Okay? That kind of piggybacks along with, again, this AB over the air update structure. Because it also ensures that if an image is downloaded into a partition that is corrupt or improperly signed or something like that, all Chrome OS has to do to roll back, or rather, Grillo rather, all they have to do to roll back is just start booting from the other partition again. So you walk through that over-the-air update structure where we download an OTA into a secondary set of partitions, but that update is bad. So when we reboot the device, it tries to boot from that stuff, but it can't. No problem. It tries once or twice, and then it just goes back to the old code. And so we can see, using the developer console, that these updates that are being shipped to these devices are corrupt or bad or something happened in that process, or we're having devices where someone has tried to manipulate the image, and the device doesn't stop working, right? If you did that on your Android phone, what would happen? It'd be a brick. You would, you'd have to figure out how to get back into recovery manually, find a new image, and flash it. With a Brillo device, it just rolls back to the existing, previously working version, and then you can figure out how to fix the update. Okay, so the devices, the functionality of the devices is not getting interrupted. Okay, so it's also very important. From the weave side of things, the added layers of security are around communication layers, right? So when, you're, when a device is weave enabled, it means that access to that device is governed by Google accounts. So the, the security and layers that we're all familiar with with the Google account structure, when a device is provisioned as a weave device, that device is provisioned as owned by a specific Google account. And that account determines who can see that device, who is it shared with. There's no more this concept, which we've seen with a lot of uh, IoT devices, of, you know what, as long as you're on the local network, I can trust you. Right? That happens with a lot of devices, which is a really bad thing from a security perspective. So instead, when a device is provisioned from Weave, you, whoever owns that account, get to control, is this device shared? Can other users just see it, or can they modify its state, or things like that? That's all built into the Weave provisioning process. Okay. So you have much more control about sharing and access to these devices. And it's governed by Google accounts, which at least by my standards, are plenty secure. Okay. And then in addition to that, all data, whether it's in flight or at rest, is always encrypted. So anything that's communicated over the lead protocol, whether it's device to device or through the cloud, is encrypted over TLS. And any device that's, or any data that sits on either the device or the servers in the cloud is always encrypted as well. Okay, so they, they do the best they can with all these different layers that Google already has in all these different areas to bring them together and provide a single product offering that is as secure as possible in today's world. Okay, while also providing all these convenient services like metrics, crash reporting, and OTA updates. Okay bringing it all together in one package for you to use for free. Okay, so the last thing that I want to touch on here today is just a little bit of a walkthrough of if I wanted to build a product using Brillo today, what would that look like? And okay, what are the steps involved? What am I as a developer going to have to deal with? That sort of thing. So it's basically in, the, in these sort of four steps here. We've got you need to find some hardware, you need to install a VSP, and I'll talk about what that means. Uh, create a product, which product is a special term in Brillo, and add some services. Okay, that's kind of where we're going with this. So the first thing you need to do is get some hardware. What I have up here are these are the currently supported boards that you can buy off the shelf today that will run Brillo. Okay? Going from left to right there, that blue board is a Dragon board, which is a Qualcomm single board computer, the Dragon board 410. The Intel Edison is there in the middle. And then the other board off there on the right-hand side is uh, the Andromeda Box by Nordell. Okay. 
All of these boards, less than 100 bucks. You can buy them from any major distributor today. So the first thing you need to do is actually get one of these boards in your hands. Uh, because today, anyway, these are the boards that are they're going to provide direct support out of the Perillo source tree. Okay? Now this doesn't mean that beyond this you can't build your own board or your own product based off of one of these or what you actually want to ship to your consumers. But when you're getting started and you want to actually just see how all this thing works, you need to start with one of these that has direct support so you can pull everything down and then kind of extend from there. The hardware requirements that Brillo is targeting are listed over here as well in case you're curious. Um, I will say right now that these are not the specs they're actually hitting, but this is where they expect to be when they actually release. You know, technically Brillo is still sort of in a private beta. Um, but 32 meg RAM, 64 meg storage, given where Android requirements are, this is pretty good. Okay, For the fact that this is actually based on an Android system. Uh, supports all architectures, 32 and 64 bit across the board, because Android supports all those things. So we're, we're sort of drawing off. The idea is if your SOC supports Android, it should support Brillo with essentially no work, because all those lower layers are unchanged. Okay. <coughs> and then Wi-Fi and Bluetooth requirements as well. All right, so I mentioned all these lower hardware specific layers before, right? Everything that's in these layers of the stack are specific from one board to another. They, 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 they change and they have to be recompiled whether you're on x86 or ARM, whether you have these peripherals installed or, or these different types of device drivers. All that stuff is specific to the actual device. Everything above that layer is pretty much consistent. So what uh, the Brillo team did that is unique from the way we used to have to do this in embedded Android is they wrapped all of that in a new, a new abstraction called a BSP or board support package. Uh, if you've done embedded development at all in one form or another, you're probably familiar with this term already. It's just never really been applied to AOSP before. So all of this stuff that is typically board dependent is now wrapped up in a single clearly defined package called BSP. And for those boards that I just described, you can get the BSPs directly from Google. Okay, so you don't have to write this code, you don't have to go to Intel or ask them to make sure that they support the Edison or anything like that. The tools provided in the Brillo Developers Kit, the BDK, allow you to download the bundle for the Edison, for the Dragon Board, etc that is the BSP, that has all this stuff in here ready to go, okay? As a product developer, well first let's take a look and see what's inside of here. So inside of BSP you effectively have firmware and vendor specific blobs that are not open source. Uh, you have definitions of how the SOC should be configured, so that's the actual, you know, the actual main processor, the x86 chip and its onboard peripherals, that sort of thing. <laughs> stuff that you probably wouldn't change even if you built your own product off of those. Then what they've done, which is actually kind of nice because it makes it extensible, is they've expanded out everything else that would be on your board into this definition of a peripheral. So what LEDs are on this board, or what are the sensors on this board, those are added as peripherals. And the Edison and the Dragon Board and the existing BSPs have a handful of those peripherals already defined. But the BSP itself is built in such a way that you could extend that and just add your own peripherals for the pieces that are on your board and reuse everything else. So you don't have to worry about moving from the Edison to some other product that you're building and think that that all of a sudden turns you into having to develop a whole BSP or something. These are extensible. They're built in such a way that you can just include the peripherals but keep everything else in the base the same. Okay? That's the idea. That's the way it's architected anyway. All right, so you have the BSP installed, now we have to create a product. I said that product is a special term in terms of Brillo, and that actually comes from its AOSP roots. So when you're building an Android-based embedded product, whether it's a Nexus device or something else along the line, if you look at the Android build system, they actually define three layers that are intended to separate different parts of a build. They have a board, a device, and a product. Okay. And they were intended to define sort of the, the hardware specific elements versus maybe taking that board and using it in several different products and the things that might be customized amongst those. So they just build on top of each other. That was the design. They didn't implement very well. 
In AOSP, with Nexus devices and other devices like that, these layers are all over the place. They interdepend on each other. Things that are in the device layer talk to things in the product layer. It's very hard to really tease out where these differences are. The Brillo team has done a great job of actually separating those layers to make it easier for someone like me or someone else in the room trying to develop a product to figure out what they actually have to touch versus the things that they can sort of leave behind. So they've separated these layers out much better and they've moved it out so that the layers that are device specific, as I mentioned before, are covered by the BSP. So that's done. And the product developer only has to deal with this one piece and they've actually moved it out of the source tree. So the other difficulty with doing these things in AOSP was that all this stuff was inside the source tree with the rest of Android. Which meant when you wanted to update to the next version of Android on your product, you had to deal with the fact that you had to merge your source tree with the upstream source tree. Okay? In this case, the product is now outside the tree completely. And this product is just a, it's, it looks like an application project. It's a directory with some build files and a source directory that you can put in your own stuff. Right? And then you build your product and it links back to all these other lower layers. So the nice thing about this is when they come out with a patch release or when the next version of the Brillo LTS is released, based on the next version of Android or whatever they decide to do, you can just swap that out wholesale, rebuild your product and move on. Okay? There's no more merging issues or anything like that because this is now done completely out of the tree. Okay? So once you've got your BSP installed, you just create this product directory and there's a tool in the BDK to do that. It just generates this project structure for you with all the build files and scripts and everything you need. And then from that point, it's just up to you to start adding services. So you add a service to toggle your LEDs or change your door lock or whatever specific to your application at that point. They just get built in. Now I will point out, Brillo does not have a concept like Android does of package management. So there's not really any idea of installing an application on a Brillo device after it's been shipped. Right? Think about an IoT device, that's probably a good thing. But it means that you're not going to be writing applications and installing them onto your Brillo device. The application services you write are going to be built into the system image with the rest of the device structure and flash at once. Okay? So this is a much more tightly coupled, embedded model than what you would have on just an Android phone or something like that. Okay, so you know I mentioned we have these lower layers here, and this part is very much in flux. This this could change a lot between now and when this is actually released. But just to give you an idea of what Brillo looks like today, effectively what they're trying to build is this API surface area between application services and the rest of the system. But right now this is quite fragmented. Uh, this actually has a number of different entry points. Some of these are in native services that are they're basically pulled directly out of Chrome OS, so you're interacting with daemons that are Chrome OS daemons. Some of these use some of the NDK APIs. Uh, like right now, interacting with sensors uses the NDK sensor APIs. And in some cases, you're just talking directly to device drivers, either because they haven't written an API yet, or they haven't come up with a good way to abstract that into an API layer. So it's a bit fragmented in terms of how you deal with this today, but hopefully, eventually, there will be a clear definition of the things that you can talk to in a more consistent way. Now, what will that look like? Well, it'll be things like connectivity, power management, sensors. Uh, they have some GPIO functionality in there for just toggling pins, uh, that kind of thing. And there is uh, some media capability. There's not really any graphics support, but they do support audio playback and that kind of thing using the native services. Okay, so some of that functionality is in there as well. And then you, your job is then to build your application on top of that layer. Okay. So as I mentioned, this today is a bit haphazard, but this is very much in flux and we might see this change a lot between now and when Bro is actually expected to be sent into its first LTS release, which they won't give us a hard date, but maybe later this year, maybe Q3 or something like that, we might see this at least come out of private beta and be more widely available to other developers uh, along the way. So if you're interested in playing with Brillo right now, um, you know, as I mentioned a couple times, the 
the access to the program itself is a private beta. So you can go to the website, you can request an invite, and they, they may or may not you know, get to that and get you into the system. However, the only thing that you are missing by not being in that program is access to their documentation. So they, they have some amount of documentation on how all this stuff works, and that's really the only thing that's behind the paywall. There's no code or no developer tools that you don't have access to today. All of that stuff is in AOSP. Okay? So I mentioned that the Weave is developed out in the open at weave.googlesource.com. If you just go to android.googlesource.com, all of the source code that builds or that makes up a Brillo system is right there. And there's nothing private that is available only to those of us who are invited versus what's in AOSP. So you could buy one of these boards, download the Android Open Source Project, and start working directly with all of these tools. Okay? The only thing you're missing are some of the getting started guides and things that might be a little bit more helpful in there. But if you're familiar enough with how AOSP code looks and how the Android source trees are put together, it should be relatively straightforward for you to figure out how to build a Brillo product and get it running up on one of these getting started boards. Okay? All right. So that's all the information that I have for you today. Um, if you want to get in contact with me at any point after this, I, you know, I'm on Twitter, Dev Unwired, G Plus, at Dave Smith Dev. Uh, Mile High Android is where you can find all my GitHub stuff, where I write sample code on any number of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my uh, personal blog wires are obsolete as well. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Looks like we have a few minutes for questions if anybody has one. Yes? Uh, before you mentioned that there's just those three boards right now that are really compatible. Correct. Is that simply because there's no uh, ESP written for any other hardware? That's exactly what that means. So, yeah. so like, give us an idea. Like, if, if somebody wants to write a ESP for, say, a Raspberry Pi B+, mm -hmm. now, it doesn't have Wi-Fi, it doesn't have Bluetooth, uh, which were some of the specs that you mentioned that Brillo requires, but yes. is it, that exten extendable? Um, so can you like, write a BSP and then extend it to a certain Bluetooth and a certain Wi-Fi adapter? For Absolutely. Yeah, and, and let me uh, let me kind of characterize it. First of all, have you ever done any AOSP development before? No. Okay, all right. So I'll, I'll use higher level terms here. But basically, the the work that would go into porting Android to, in your example, the Raspberry Pi, um, is the same effort that you would go through to build a BSP. Really, you just need to make sure that the, uh, the boot loader works correctly. Uh, for the Raspberry Pi. And in this case for Brillo, what that means is that the bootloader matches the Chrome OS spec, that it supports that AV partition scheme. Um, but all they define there is a specification of how it should behave. They don't actually like provide the code or anything like that. So as long as the bootloader on your Raspberry Pi supports that, the Linux kernel has all the appropriate drivers to work on the Raspberry Pi. And you have the right hardware abstraction layer elements, which you would have needed to run Android on that as well. Um, that is your BSP. So as long as it's, it would require a little bit of knowledge or experience on how you would get Android up and running on a board. Because those same three or four elements that you would do for that make up the Brillo BSP. It's just that from a product developer's perspective, they abstract all of that away so that if someone wants to use Brillo in a product, they don't have to have the knowledge of that stuff. They can just build native code on top of that structure. So can we assume that a someone's going to do that for us, so we can just have it for us. I think in a lot of cases, yes. I mean, like I said, uh, there, are, there are three boards that are public. I can't tell you how many, but there are more boards that are expected. Um, so there will be more than three, probably, by the time this leaves private beta. Um, and there are already people working on BSPs for other boards that aren't even in that list, um, like the Raspberry Pi. Um, so there's there's definitely going to be a chance that you don't have to just be narrowed down to these options if you want to try this out. But those are going to be the ones that Google is going to put their stamp on, if you will. So I, I can't say for sure whether or not there will be a Google certified BSP for a Raspberry Pi. But I can be almost certain that a BSP for the Raspberry Pi will exist somewhere, whether it's on the community forums or something like that. You just won't download it directly from Google. Now, to your question about the Wi-Fi Bluetooth piece, uh, the, those hardware requirements really have to do primarily with being a Google certified image. So there's this idea that, uh, sort of like with Android devices, if you pass CTS, you can be a certified device and you have all the benefits. Uh, if you support all the appropriate hardware, 
then your BSP can be considered certified under that program. So you could write one that gets Brillo up and running but doesn't have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in it. It's just not going to meet that spec. And you're going to have a heck of a time running Weave, but beyond that, you might be able to use some of the other layers. Good question. Other questions? Yes? Uh, in the over-the-air updates, what pushes up? Is it just the product level, or can you actually modify your hardware definitions? Sure. So it is an entire system image. Okay. It's essentially the same thing that you, well, technically speaking, it's not the same. But conceptually, it's the same thing as an over-the-air update to your Android phone, which means you're updating all layers of the okay. image there. It's the system image and, and all of those pieces. The one difference there is that the uh, in Android, the developer of the product has to manually create that update package. It, you know, it's sort of like a difference between one system image and another, and they have to create the script that gets run in recovery. Um, that's actually done automatically for you in Brillo. So you can upload your old system image, and later on you upload your new system image. The Weave developer console generates the delta necessary and ships it to the bus. So it is a delta update, and it's actually created for you. Good question. Other questions? Yes. So if, if people were looking at IoT stuff today, is this real something where, that you look at and you say, well, gee, I better not buy smart things, I better not buy this, because it's going to be part of this stack that's you know, not necessarily you know, proprietary in the, the legal sense, but just kind of the de facto sense. Is it, is it something that this is just the hardware basis and they expect management to be something different, or is this kind of the, the whole stack? It, it, it's, yeah, it's a good question. I would say that yes, it's very, it very much covers many levels of the stack, right? You know, you've got the idea that Brillo itself really is the implementation of the software stack on the hardware. You know, it covers things like getting the system up and running, connectivity services, all that lower level stuff. But at least at the current time, and I don't see them necessarily changing that, those core services that I mentioned, like Weave and the other bits, are very tightly integrated into that platform. So that means you're being very tightly integrated into Google services all the way down. Right? Because Weave is going to talk to Google servers back ends. You're using the Weave developer console to interact with things like metrics and OTA updates. So that layer very much ties a real product to Google services. And at least as it stands today, it's not that you can't separate the two. You could use Brillo without all that stuff. But um, Weave in particular sort of ties in a lot of those things that they become kind of useless without. So I would say that the potential is there, but they very much want to provide it as a more of a turnkey solution that takes you all the way up the stack. Good question. Other questions? Yes? Uh, you were talking about discoverability early on. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little more about how that actually happens in the real world right now? You mean just, just technically, how are they doing it? Uh, well, what does that mean? Because one of the big tricks in that system or IoT stuff is securely getting out of the local network. Sure. And that's often solved with an app or some other interface, a screen, uh, a web server that you log into. Right. What's what's the discoverability that you're talking about? Sure. So I'll speak to a couple different things there. The first is that the end goal, as I understand it, um, is that a Brillo device should be able to be discovered over an active Wi-Fi or active Bluetooth interface. Okay. Uh, not all of that is working yet. Today, effectively, only discoverability over Wi-Fi uh, is functioning. And effectively, it works the same way that a lot of devices probably do, that when a device is unprovisioned, uh, it acts as a Wi-Fi access point. So that if you can find that device, you can connect to it, and then using the Weave protocol, you can securely provision that device onto your network and associate it with your Google account. So that's sort of all like at the same time. Test. Sorry. Not like how the works. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I I think that and as far as an application is concerned, the intention is right now this is all about the apps, but the intention is Weave eventually should be built directly into the network. So at some point, someone with an Android device can find a Weave device automatically using the platform. Now, this is also supported on the iOS side, and in that case, there will probably have to be some sort of a Weave management app. But it's one application for all that, as opposed to I have the Nest app, I have this app, you know, uh, the Weibo app, and all these other things to provision these elements. I may still have those apps to interact with those devices, but I don't need them to get online. 
And the other advantage there is that the part of the Weave flow is that Weave can direct the user to that app. Instead of them having to find it themselves, the end of the flow can be, oh, there's an app for this. Did you want to go download it? Because that's built into the Weave schema. Cool. Good question. Yes? Um, assuming in future uh, most of the devices will be um, um, controlled through a, I mean, a mobile device, has Drillo or, or for that matter, um, IoT developers uh, have considered the kind of interference uh, problems that might occur because there are so many things on the network? Oh, interference, yeah, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, you mean just the fact that the networks might become more and more crowded? Yeah. Uh, I think a couple ideas, and I'm really just speculating on this to be honest, but um, a couple ideas there might be that Wi-Fi is not necessarily going to be the only transport. Um, so they, they do want to support things like uh, doing all this discoverability and communication over Bluetooth 4.0 as well, um, which might help separate that out a little bit. I mean, they're all in the same spectrum, but their channel specifications are completely different. Uh, and the other part there might just be that if you look at the way that the Wi-Fi specifications are evolving, they are evolving to handle more and more traffic with each one, either by changing the channel hopping frequencies or by changing the number of channels that they can actually spread. So I think that's going to be more on the developers of uh, the newer versions of the Wi-Fi standards to help us along with that, as opposed to trying to deal with that at the protocol level, because uh, I don't know that we'll be able to do that. One of the tricks is, when you want this whole thing to integrate back to the phone in your pocket, there's only so many radios you can work with. You know, this thing has a Wi-Fi radio and it has a Bluetooth radio. There are plenty of IoT devices that use 900 megahertz radios, Zigbee radios, stuff like that, which is fine for talking to each other, but when I want to connect to it, it has to have one of those back because it's all that's in my phone. So there's a bit of a constraint there that makes this user accessible uh, to some degree. So that's kind of my point. Yes? You mentioned Zigbee, Zigbee, etc. type of Nothing's built in. So the, the way that they see it is if you want to use Zigbee in device-to-device -device communication or maybe you want to implement Thread is another one they've been talking about a lot, um, or some of those other protocols, there's nothing precluding you from putting that in your real device. The only one that they're going to provide for free is the Weave protocol, which is really more about connecting users to those devices than it is about device-to-device -device communication. It supports that. But if you'd rather use a different protocol for that, you can use Weave more as the provisioning, updating, you know, user interfacing protocol to those devices. So they're, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. All right, I think that's all the time I have. If you have any other questions, feel free to come up. But thank you guys for your time.